Hello, my name is Andy Erzik from Milwaukee County EMS. I'm just going to spend the next couple of minutes going through some of the protocol updates and changes that have taken place as of October 1st of 2015. On this form here, uh, you can see all the different changes that have taken place. A copy of this document was sent to every uh, EMS liaison for each fire department. I'm just going to quickly go through it, uh, hit some of the high points here. And a lot of this stuff will also be discussed, these topics will also be discussed later on in this presentation. Uh, first protocol that we've seen some changes to is Ebola. Really just making sure if we have an identified high-risk patient that may have Ebola, if that patient does pass away, making sure that we do notify the medical examiner. That way they are able to get in touch with other people that may have come in contact to that patient. Our medical medication list has also been updated. We went through every medication now. It has its contraindications, indications, dosing for both adult and pediatric patients, and a list of outcomes and possible side effects that we'll have. And I'll show you that whole form in a couple slides here. Uh, as far as spinal movement precautions, we're basically following the same algorithm that we used before, just making sure that Basically, every patient, if time allows, is to be placed on the backboard, on the cot, I'm sorry. So when the protocol states padded backboard, it's referring to your cot, not a long board with some blankets on it. As far as interosseous infusion, we did add lidocaine into our protocols for this. This only applies to conscious patients. If the patient's P and B, you're not going to waste the time to give lidocaine to numb up the area. But for comfort reasons, if a patient is conscious and needs either IV fluids or medications, we can give lidocaine to help make them more comfortable. Once again, we'll talk about that later on. Another protocol that was changed, this is just a change in wording for your tachycardia with pulses protocol. Uh, it used to say if patient is unresponsive or hypotension, then we can jump to treating the tachycardia with electricity through like a cardioversion. Now we just change it to if the patient has LOC or hypertensive. So either one, either they're altered or if they're hypotension or both, you can jump right to synchronized cardioversion because those are signs of an unstable patient. As far as IV push medications, we just want to make sure that we're giving them slowly. Um, there's five medications. Uh, your dextrose, diphyhydramine or Benadryl, fentanyl, midazolam, and Zofran. These medications do need to be given over two minutes. I'll walk you through that a little bit later. It is a brand new protocol. Another protocol that was changed is defibrillation. We're seeing in some of our studies and feedback from the Zol that paramedics are using the analyze button on the Zol. Uh, that we are never to do. When you put it into analyze mode, it kicks the Zoll into AED mode. And then it's basically just like an AED would work for any lay person or rescuer. It really makes our pre-shock pauses way too long. And the longer we go off the chest or not doing CPR while working with the Zoll, the outcome for the patient gets pretty dire. So we're taking a look at the rhythm. We're identifying whether it's a treatable rhythm, and we're shocking. We're not relying on the Zoll to do it through its AED mode. Next one is just a policy change of a transport destination. Wheaton Franciscan Franklin is now a STEMI hospital, so you can take your heart attack patients there. They are also a ROSC hospital. So they still are not a stroke receiving facility, but your STEMI ROSC patients can now go to uh, Wheaton Franciscan Franklin. Uh, interosseous infusion, that protocol has been deleted. It's just been added into the IO, IO administration of lidocaine protocol. And spinal mobilization, once again, it was replaced by spinal movement precaution protocol, which we've already covered. Just making sure that your patients, if time allows, end up on the cot and not on a longboard. So taking a closer look here at defibrillation, uh, we're all pretty used to what we're supposed to do here. We want to be able to shock the heart and hopefully bring it back into a perfusing rhythm. That being said, we'll move on to the next part here. 
nothing has really changed in this protocol. We're just pointing out the fact that if ALS is on scene, that they are the patient will be on the ALS ZOL, and that the ZOL never gets put into rescue mode. So we never hit the analyze button. We are the ones analyzing. We're the ones that are going to be defibrillating, cardioverting. So we're not relying on ZOL for that. Make sure you're using that see-through puck so that you're able to watch the patient's rhythm even while you're doing CPR so that you're very very quickly able to de deliver a shock and then move on to CPR again. So, like I said, just to recap, we do not use the rescue mode on the X-Series Zole. We do not place defib pads over an implanted pacemaker, so you just move the pad off to the side a little bit. Also, we don't put the pad over any kind of sticker like a nitro patch or some kind of pain management patch. And it's pretty straightforward. If the patient's in a pool or wet environment, remove them from that environment, dry them off as best you can before you attempt to defibrillate. All right, so this was the medication list that I was talking about a little bit earlier. It's just been updated. So going through the policy here, all medications will be administered and documented as it's outlined in this medication list. Make sure that you are checking concentrations of the medication. The pharmacy is pretty good at getting us the same medications each time, same concentrations, but just in case that would ever change, you could massively over or underdose a patient by not paying attention to those concentrations. IV bolus medication are to be administered in under 10 seconds, and then a slow or just an IV push medication will be given over one to two minutes. So we'll go through the medications here. Adenosine, that has not changed. That's going to be obviously a rapid push because we need to get it to the heart as fast as possible to try to cardiovert that patient. Albuterol, ipatropium, bromide, or your dual NEB. Once again, there's no changes there. Amiodarone, also no changes. Aspirin, just keeping in mind this change was made a little bit ago. There is no contraindication to giving aspirin except allergy. So if we do have a pregnant female, we're still going to give them the 324 aspirin because our job is to make get the mother to the hospital alive because that gives the best chance of the fetus surviving as well. So only contraindication for aspirin, allergy. Atropine, there is a slight change here. Dr. Brown is one of our medical directors from Children's Hospital. He just wanted to make some slight dose changes here. So for atropine, down an ET tube, the dosing for a pediatric patient is now 0.04 milligrams per kilogram. Continuing on, once again, this is still for atropine. For pediatric patients, in the event of an organophosphate poisoning, you notice this by going through your SLUDGE acronym. For kids, your dose is going to be 0.5 milligrams of atropine for an organophosphate poisoning. Also, we changed calcium chloride, which we used to carry, that has been removed off the ambulances. Now we're going to be giving calcium gluconate. Your dose is going to be 3 grams with a max dose of 3 grams. Pediatric patient dosing is 60 milligrams per kilogram. This is going to be an IV push or slow push, so over 2 to 5 minutes. Really making sure we're keeping an eye on our EKG to make sure that we're not causing any kind of rhythm disturbances. Uh, you're going to be giving it for uh, with guidance from med control for suspected hyperkalemia in a person that is in cardiac arrest. So once again, you'll be talking to medical control before giving this. D5W, this, as far as medications we use for a drip, lidocaine is not used anymore for card cardiac patients. We'll be using amiodarone. The ELP study is now over, so we're going to go back to our protocol of using amiodarone for these situations. Dextrose, there's no change in dosing there. Obviously, it's for hypoglycemia, and if the patient's hypoglycemic, there's no contraindication to giving dextrose. Just making sure if it is a child that you are diluting it one-to-one, -one, uh, just because dextrose is pretty hard on vessels, and for a pediatric patient, it can be very damaging to their veins. So we do want to cut that in half and dilute the medication. Uh, as far as Benadryl or diphenhydramine, 
dosing has not changed for adults. For kids, we just simplified it a little bit. It used to say one milligram per kilogram if they're under 20 milligrams. Now we're just going to be giving 25 milligrams, or one milligram per kilogram up to a max dose of 25 milligrams. And this could either be IV, IO, push. It is a slow push, so over two minutes. Also, and obviously, you can use that for anaphylaxis. Dopamine, nothing has changed there. Dual dote kit, nothing has changed there as well. Uh, just depending on which service you work with and who actually carries it, whether it's on your ambulance or if, uh, say, uh, uh, some one of the chiefs carries it in their rig, it kind of is just dependent on which service you work for. All right, then continuing on with Epi, uh, 1 to 1,000 for uh, anaphylaxis. Adults, the dose is exactly the same as it was before. You'll be giving 0.3 milligrams IM. Uh, for kids, instead of taking the time and going through the 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram, we're just going to administer the child with a dose of 0.15 milligrams. It's easier to draw up. That's what kids would have anyways in their pediatric uh, auto-injector. So for simplicity and making it so we can give the medication faster, we're just going to go with a straight 0 0.15 milligrams. Epi, uh, 1 to 10,000, nothing has changed there. Uh, your dosaging has stayed the same. And then as far as giving IM injections, we do have a new preferred site. We do want to go in the vastus lateralis. Uh, you can see in the middle top picture up here, and it's the outer aspect or the lateral aspect of the thigh. It's a nice, big, easy site to hit. Fortunately, we'll either have to pull up or lower the pants to get to it. If for some reason it would take too long to get to the vastus lateralis, you still can use the deltoid. Just document why you used it, but the vastus lateralis is now our preferred site. Fentanyl, there's been no dose, no changes there. Just remember, we're not doing fentanyl in increments of 25, 50, 75, 100. We're giving it one microgram per kilogram. So making sure you take the patient's weight, get it in kilograms, and then giving the appropriate dose of one microgram per kilogram. Uh, same thing for pediatric patients, just using a different max dose and going with 0.5 to 1 microgram per kilogram. This is a slow push. We do not want all that medication hitting the brain at one time. It can cause nauseousness. It can drop blood pressure. So using the appropriate dose and giving it over the appropriate amount of time. Glucagon has not changed. Glucose has not changed. If you do carry the cyano kit, once again, this is your protocol for how it's given. And then it just depends on what service you work for as to who carries it. Uh, whether it's on all the ambulance or if just one specific unit would carry it. Ketamine, there is another indication for this now. Originally it was exclusively for excited delirium. Now you can also give it to people that are an immediate threat to themselves or others. So you have two indications now. Really make sure we're giving the appropriate dosing here. So it's one milligram per kilogram. If we're going IV and remembering that has to be diluted one to one. Otherwise, if we're going IM, that is three milligrams per kilogram, not diluted, just straight medication. But this is a very strong drug, ketamine is. Uh, you really need to watch heart rate and rhythm, especially watching respiratory rate. Ketamine is used in the hospital for to put people down for surgery, um, for conscious sedation, to put broken bones back together. So it's a very strong drug. So also watching blood pressure, watch their consciousness, uh, keeping in mind that they can have hallucinations from this, and also it can cause excessive salvation. But really, respiratory rate is the main thing you're going to want to keep an eye on. Midazolam, no change in dosing there. It is usually a slow IV push, so over two minutes. If you do have a patient with like excited delirium and you choose to start with Versed, that would be more of like a rapid IM push. Narcan, no changes there. New changes, it still is 0.5 milligrams, and you step it up until you get the desired effect, which is to get a respiratory drive back. We don't need to completely wake them up. We just need to get them breathing again. Nitroglycerin, dosing has not changed. The only change is that we need to see, it used to be 48 hours. 
if a patient had taken a Viagra-type medication or a pulmonary hypertensive medication, that's been changed to 72 hours. So now you have to be longer than 72 hours after taking Viagra before we could administer a nitroglycerin. Uh, normal saline has not changed. Zofran, as far as the oral tablet, which is placed under the tongue where it dissolves, gets into the bloodstream really quickly because it's absorbed in the mouth, not by the stomach. Zofran being pushed IV. Just keep in mind this is a slow push. Patients generally can handle this medication without any issue, but it can cause some QT elongation. So slow push over two minutes just to avoid any possible side effects. And then finally, sodium bicarb. Our dosing has not changed there at all. Lidocaine, which was just recently added on. Um, on the bottle, it does say xylocaine, which is a generic lidocaine. But directly below that on the label, you can see that it is lidocaine. We will be giving this to conscious patients that need an IO. The dosing for that is one milligram per kilogram, up to a max dose of 40. And then for kids, you can also see that the dosing is one milligram per kilogram, also up to a max dose of 40 milligrams. Once again, when you're drawing up this medication, you're going to go ahead, put in your IO. You're going to slowly give the medication. You're going to give it over two minutes. You're going to let the medication sit in the bone for another minute to help numb up that cortex. And then after that, you're going to take a, at least a 5 to 10 cc flush. Give it a really hard push. Helps make that pocket inside the bone marrow so that your IV fluids will run easier. So just, yes, you're going to be giving the medication over two minutes, waiting 60 seconds, let it sit in the bone, and then doing your rapid flush. And this will definitely help um, relieve some of the pain that is caused by in infusing fluids. On this slide here, you can just see our IO that we usually use, the easy IO. I know they are trialing some, certain departments are trialing some different IO devices. Uh, no matter what, how the IO is placed, the flushing will still be the same. So you're going to take your extension set. You're going to, first of all, just flush that with some of the lidocaine. And then when the IO is in, you're going to screw it on. Give the rest of the lidocaine over two minutes. Wait one minute, and then use your flush and start giving any medications. Once again, this is just for conscious patients. There's no point in wasting this much time if the patient's P&B. So as you can see, once again, just going through the actual protocol itself, is the patient's conscious? Yes. Then you're going to go down, administering lidocaine one milligram per kilogram up to a max dose of 40. You're giving the medication over two minutes. Then you're waiting a minute, letting the medication take effect. And then you're going to do your rapid flush and then start giving medications or fluids that way. Just finishing up the protocol. You'll be doing an I.O. basically if you're unable to get an IV quickly. And then any kind of contraindication for placing an I.O. would just be obviously a fractured tib fib. Um, or it could be a fractured humerus if you're going to be using the humoral head. Which is a great alternative site when you are get putting in an I.O. to use the humoral head. And then obviously if there's any kind of infection or rash abscess, we're not going to want to put our needle through that into the bloodstream because... There's a high risk then of the making the patient septic on top of already being sick. As far as tachycardia with pulses, um, like I said, uh, the protocol has been updated. Nothing on this first part of the protocol has been changed. In the next part, it's just a slight changing of words. Where it used to say unresponsive or hypotensive, now it's altered LOC or hypotensive. This way we are able to treat people as they're starting to get more critical instead of having to wait for them to be fully unresponsive before we can treat with electricity. So just slight word changing there. Finishing off that protocol, nothing's changed here. Just remembering as far as adenosine, we don't give that to people that have had a heart transplant. If they have a heart block, we're not going to use it in anyone that's had, was in cardiac arrest if they're tachycardic it's because they're circulating all that epi we've been giving them. Also Tegretol and other medications. Uh, we do 
Adenosine has a very short half-life, so we are giving it a very rapid push and then following it at least 10 cc's of normal saline. Otherwise, if we do give adenosine or any time we're cardioverting at all, make sure we are printing out a strip so that we're able to see what rhythm they're in as that rhythm slows down a little bit. We may notice it's a atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or just an atrial tachycardia, and that can change our treatment slightly. And then finally, carotid massage is not something that we use here in Milwaukee County. As far as IV push medications, we went over this in the medication list earlier on in this, this lecture. Um, just making sure that we're giving medications over one to two minutes. We don't want that massive high concentration of drug hitting the body all at one time. We want to slowly build up the blood concentration over a matter of minutes. So by doing this, you can alleviate or get rid of some of the risk of giving medications. Like if you would give uh, fentanyl too fast, you can cause nauseousness or possibly vomiting, which could create an airway issue. So really, by slowly building up the concentration, less chance of side effects. So just kind of continuing on just with your IV push medications. Obviously, you're going to go through your 5Rs, and you're going to prepare the medication some kind of access, whether it's peripheral IV, jugular, IO, uh, making sure that we are always cleaning or using an alcohol prep to clean off the ports. We don't want to introduce any bacteria into the bloodstream. All right, we're going to insert the medication through the port, so you're going to slowly just start pushing it in. And this is specifically with a medication that you're giving while running in IV fluids. So it's just real quick. You pinch off the tubing, give a little bit of medication, let go of the pinch, let some fluid go by, diluting down the medication, pinch, more drugs, and then just repeat over that two minute time, and then the medication's infused. Just make sure that after you do finish giving the medication, you take saline flush and flush out that port, because some of that medication is gonna stay stuck there. And if you'd introduce another medication through there, you could have a drug interaction, and we do not want that. Next one is just your transportation destination protocol, making sure that patients are transported to the closest, most appropriate hospital. So taking a look at the patient's medical condition, are they going to be able to make it to a certain hospital, or do you need to stop at the closest ER for some kind of airway adjunct? Uh, we can also go on patient's request if they're medically capable or they're doing okay and able to make it to their requested location, or possibly taking them to the place where they normally see their doctor, or with their insurance or HMO dictates that they go to a certain facility. If they're critical, we're taking them to the closest facility and we can work out all this stuff later on. Wheaton Franciscan Franklin is now a STEMI and ROSC hospital. They are not a stroke hospital at this time, but they have been added on to the STEMI ROSC hospital list. You can also see it on this slide as well, just listing them Franklin as a Milwaukee County EMS PCI receiving hospital. So they are capable of doing an emergency catheterization. And then final thing here, uh, just once again talking a little bit about Ebola. If this patient is a Wheaton Franciscan patient, they need to be transported to St. Joe's Hospital. If they are a Freightert patient, they can go to Freightert. If they're an Aurora patient, they can go to Sinai, St. Luke's, or West Dallas. Pro Healthcare, they can go out to Pro Healthcare in Waukesha area. But if they do see a Wheaton Franciscan doctor, which makes Wheaton Franciscan their medical home, they are to be transported to St. Joe's. That's just what Wheaton prefers that we do. Otherwise, that's pretty much it for the presentation. Thank you for spending this time with me. Remember that all these protocols went into effect on October 1st, so they are now active. Um, anyways, thank you, and have a good day.